So, Roger Edwards, a yes. few weeks ago, we reviewed the marketing of The Lost Boys, and you declared that that was a movie that made it cool to be a vampire. And in yes. fact, you wanted to be a vampire following watching The Lost Boys. I'm going to argue that today's film, Blade, proves that it is cool to be a vampire, whether you are a good vampire, as the day walker or a bad vampire as Deacon Frost. Yeah, it's an interesting one because obviously in Lost Boys it was a couple of young kids with uh, makeshift makeshift crosses and uh, baths full of garlic that defeated the vampires. Whereas in Blade, the vampires have got this gigantic bloke in a great big long black coat with shades on, with armour armor plating and a great big sword chasing them down. So I'm not sure it's as cool to be a vampire in Blade when you've got him coming after you <laughs> as it was in Lost Boys when all you do is hang around uh, fairgrounds picking up pretty girls and, uh, and, uh, and feeding off the blood of the locals. But, but yeah, it, it is another of those films which does try to turn vampirism into something cool. And that's reflected in the music of the film. It's reflected in the style. You know, it's it was a good decade after Lost Boys, but I can still see quite a lot of parallels in the visuals and in the, in the, the way that they put it together. Um, now, I've got an admission to make here, Pascal. I watched this last night in preparation okay. mm -hmm. for today's podcast and i went into watching it fully thinking that this is actually just a refresher so that i can talk about this with pascal tomorrow and i watched the start and there's this incredibly iconic opening set in a nightclub and the music is incredible the atmosphere is incredible and there's an amazing fight sequence but after that <laughs> there was a lot about the film which i'm thinking i just don't recognize this I don't know whether I've actually seen this. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed every single minute of it. It's a fabulous film, and I would quite happily watch it again tonight. Action-packed, great characters, great visuals, great special effects, great music. But I do wonder now whether somehow <laughs> I actually missed it way back when it first came out in 1998. Well, thank you for the confession. And I shall think, and the viewers and listeners shall think of a rightful you know, punishment because how did you miss this? <laughs> how did I miss this it? This was a 1998 you know, success story of all success stories when really this was a low to medium you know, sized budget film. But everybody talked about it, and we will talk about the marketing bit and how they exploited PR, you know, to its full. But, you know, here we are where vampires are essentially wealthy. They are in every part of society, from the police to oil company to tech companies and so on, but they are very discreet. But as is often the case in stories, there is, you know, in a, a disruption comes from the younger generation yes. of vampires led by Deacon Frost, who says, hang on a minute, humans are our food. Let's stop hiding in the shadows and take over the world. And they've got that, therefore, conflict internally within the, within the vampire ranks. And of course, they are being chased by the character Blade, played by Wesley Snipes, and his mentor, Whistler, played by Christopher Christopherson. Absolutely. And, and uh, Chris Christopherson, great, great character actor. I remember him being in a film called Convoy many, many, oh, many yeah, years yeah, ago about, uh, about lorry drivers. But uh, yeah, I mean, Wesley Snipes looks incredibly cool in this film, doesn't he? As I say, the, the, um, the image of him in that long, dark coat, he's got the heavy-duty armour on, he's got the sword with all the, the fancy things that keep snapping out of it, and the cool shades, and he's, and he's just got that power and demeanour about him. And he's an incredible martial artist as well. I mean, some of the martial arts fighting sequences in this film are remarkable absolutely remarkable and again i i think i said this when we when we were talking about lost boys every vampire film and every vampire tv series just rewrites vampire lore a little bit to fit with the what they wanted to get out of it so i think in this film the vampires can't go out in daylight and and they can be affected by um, garlic and they can be killed by silver but crosses don't affect them in this film um so that, that, that's quite interesting. But one thing that I've never come across 
in a vampire movie before and that this is the diff the difference between some of the older vampires in this who apparently were born as vampires as opposed to the younger one who was actually converted from a human to a vampire so i have this image in my head of actual vampire babies being born i don't know whether that's wrong or not no but i think that's what was interesting so this is based obviously on a graphic novel that yes. was produced by the Marvel brand. So here's the thing as well. Now, in 1998, we didn't really appreciate that. That came much, much later. But this is the first Marvel adaptation to the big screen of a comic book graphic novel character. Normally, people always say, oh, Iron Man 2008 was it, you know, the first adaptation, but because they forget about Blade, because it was never really used as part of the, the marketing campaign. And very often people will say, oh, isn't Black Panther amazing in 2018 because it had a lead actor that was black? I said, well, I'm sorry, what about Blade 20 years mm. prior? So mm. I think what, what is also very interesting is that there was some um, assets that the marketing campaign could have used that wasn't used because it just didn't come to mind at the time that this was such a significant movie production, the first adaptation of a character from a graphic novel from the Marvel Universe. Yeah, and of course, all the Marvel films, Iron Man onwards, have that Marvel sort of introduction, don't they, where mm. it sort of goes fast forward through a lot of the uh, the comics. And, and that became an iconic way to introduce each film, whereas this, obviously, it, 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 it wasn't. But technically, does that mean that Blade could have turned up within other Marvel films then? Well, funny enough you should ask the question, Monsieur Roger Edwards, because they are looking to reboot Blade as uh -huh. a storyline franchise with a blessing of what is it, Snipes, who will just have a cameo. They're looking for a new actor. And yes, Blade will appear within, you know, what we now know to be the MCU. But there is a problem. And the problem is as follows, which is Blade is 18 rated. This is a movie for adults, I would argue, because mm. of the storyline is complex, the action, the violence, the blood, the explosions, and so on and so forth, the language, primarily by the character of Whistler. And I just don't know because I think most of the Marvel movies are either 12 or 15 rated. So ah. I think they have a problem. And I want Blade to remain like Blade. I mean, I don't want it to become Blade Light. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I did notice again last night some of Wesley Snipes' lines reminded me of Jules in Pulp Fiction. Um, and I think Pulp Fiction was about four years before Blade. Uh, but I, there's, there's one line where he says something like, aim for the, the head or, or aim for the heart, but if you miss, that means your ass. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Jules yeah. would have said that in, in Pulp Fiction. Um, but uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can fully agree with you. Blade benefited from being and a movie for adults in the special... I mean, it's quite gory, isn't it? In the special effects, it's quite a violent film. The uh, the martial arts work is tip-top, I think. Absolutely, mm. you know, it's proper. You know, they're hurting each other when they're hitting each other, and uh, it would be a shame to dilute it, definitely. Oh, I mean, you, you give me segues into so many things I want to talk about. So to begin with, <laughs> the writing. Let's, you know, give David S. Goya, you know, really a big applause because I think that's why Blade works so well. It was very very well written and written with a view of creating uh, a world of vampires that we've not seen before so we, mm. we i mentioned a moment ago that they are part of society they just you know do it very discreetly but we learn about you know the, the house of erebus they have their own language yes. there is obviously the prophecy of la magra and the the blood god you've got all sort of things that frankly uh, prior to Blade, there was never that depth of looking into the world of vampires. And as you said, the difference between being a pure blood and someone's been bitten, which is, by the way, one well, of the motivation of the villain, Deacon Frost, is yeah. not a pure blood. He wants a seat at the table of the House the of table. Erebus, and he's denied that, and therefore he's going to take matters in his own hand. But you know, David S. Goya, you know, wrote Dark City, one of my you know, all-time kind of, again, uh, guilty pleasures when it comes to sci-fi movies. He's behind Batman Begins, he's behind The Man of Steel, Terminator, Dark Fate, and so on. And in fact, many fans are suggesting that if you look at Dark City and Blade, they are in some ways paving the grounds for the matrix yes that's right and 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 again you know the argument 
of Wesley Snipes with his black glasses on and his long black coat <laughs> was very Matrix Matrix esque, wasn't it? What is lovely is that the director was not necessarily someone that had a long track record. Stephen Norrington from the UK, hooray. And yep. he has a background in set design and special effects, which I think served the movie really well because the use of the urban landscape, uh, both uh, kind of indoors and outdoor, and when they go into the underground library to meet the character of Pearl, the bookkeeper, I mm. think that's really well designed as well, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And the, and the final set in the oh, um, it al almost yes. looked like a, a gothic missile chamber to me, mm. um, where the the final fight takes place. Incredible piece Incredible. of set design. They really yeah. squeezed yeah. every single pound from that budget, you know. But Absolutely. what is what is lovely as well is you're right. It really did showcase martial arts, so uh, which helped. I think the marketing. We're going to come on to in a minute. I do promise our viewers and listeners. So. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we know because of this biography that Wesley Snipes is an accomplished martial artist. He has a keen interest in Shotokan Karate, Apkido, but also has tried his hand in, in Jiu-Jitsu and mixed martial arts and so on. Because Blade, as a character, he has to move right. So yes. do you understand when you know when David S. Goya and Stephen Norrington was told by the studios, well, what about Denzel Washington instead of Wesley Snipes so we can make more money? They must have just gone, no. I mean, we love Denzel. I love, you love Denzel, Roger, but you need a martial artist to pull this off. And if you've looked at Wizard Snipes' you know, kind of uh, filmography from Streets of Gold all the way to U.S. Marshals, Passenger 57 and more, The Munition Man, you knew that there was, on, there was the only option but to ask him to be played. Absolutely right. No, it would have been, it would not have been the <laughs> film it was had it been uh, the other guy. <laughs> so... We better talk about the marketing, I think, Pascal. <laughs> so let's do that. Um, for me, what is lovely about Blade, and because at the time it was made 1998, the option was very simple. 100% pure old-fashioned public relations, and mm -hmm. they nailed it. And to me, that is also a lesson for modern marketers. We do not do enough PR, and I can imagine PR agents and professionals uploading this, but I think that what they did so well is whilst they, of course, created the film that we now know, and the long film for the Times, you know, two hours, which is mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. already breaking boundaries, they went all in on the PR, because what else was there, Roger? Of course, you had the, 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 the poster, just one, which was very clever, and a very good trailer, but they went all in on the PR. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let, 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 let's just give a shout out for the the tagline as well fabulous tagline the power of an immortal the soul of a human the heart of a hero that is great copy isn't it it's the rule of three copy. it always works yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's funny do you know I'm, I'm i'm thinking back now this is episode 36 of two geeks and we don't we haven't really talked about pr much have we um and, and this is ironic because when I was marketing director in big corporate, PR was actually one of the things that I enjoyed most about my job. I used to love getting out and talking to journalists and, and getting in touch with publications and putting together press releases and that sort of thing. And yes, I guess a lot of people forget that PR is part of the marketing mix. Um, I deliberately wrote a chapter on PR in my book, Cats, Mats and Marketing Plans, but it does tend to get overlooked, doesn't it? Mm. I started as a young marketing officer, as you know, in London, in the travel industry, and PR was it. I mean, yes, we mm -hmm. advertised mm -hmm. in on CFAX, if you remember those days. Yes, we did, you know, work with the travel agents and, and we did advertising, but PR, briefing travel journalists, you know, taking people uh, to the different destinations so that they can review them in their magazines. So what they could do with Blade was obviously target different audiences. So mm -hmm. the martial arts community, you can imagine, couldn't wait so... I was reading at the time in the UK, there was a magazine called Impact Magazine. Right. Actually, claim to fame, Chris Ducker and I used to write articles for Impact Magazine reviewing <laughs> uh, Hong Kong movies. So, um, But movies in and around martial arts, from you know Impact to Martial Arts Illustrated to Kung Fu Illustrated in the US and so on, interviewed, was it Stan, but interviewed also the martial arts or, uh, or screen fighting designer, Jeff Imada, who's really well known in Los Angeles. But of course, part of um, 
what was lovely for Blade is most of the bad vampires, the, the henchmen, as they are listed in the credits, were screen fighters from Hollywood and Los Angeles. So yes. you could almost take pleasure in spotting J.J. Perry and Simon Ree uh, and Jeffy Maddai and a few others. Indeed, even um, Stephen Norrington um, is one of the vampires in the nightclub with the infamous bloodbath uh, uh, kind of uh, fair. So you have that targeting. Then they're targeting, of course, um, goth and people who dress mm -hmm. using leather. What well, wouldn't you? Then you have those who <laughs> like weapons. Then you've got, of course, vampire fans, horror fans. You name it, they just went for it. And what was important is everybody within the, the cast and crew made themselves available for TV interviews, radio interviews, and print media interviews, so much so that they could declare how much they enjoy working on the film, which I think is also an important message because all too often, Roger, we hear people having a rough time making movies, mm. but those mm. guys had a blast, but wouldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and am I right in thinking that they actually, as part of the PR campaigns, they, they had a load of vampire parties all over America? <laughs> yeah. So again, good PR stunt, you know, to be reported yeah. back and inviting all, all the right people. And what is lovely, of course, is... It, uh, uh, 10 years later, 20 years later, the cast and crew still talk about the film. People write articles, do video reviews. The 4K um, box set was released uh, for Christmas last year. So yeah. as a movie, the first time Marvel adaptation, 1998, I think it's done really well. It stood the test of time, you know, mm. and like 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 vampires are immortal. <laughs> Blade, Blade has become almost like immortal itself, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, as I say, Pascal, last night I watched this and thought, I'm sure I, I was convinced I'd seen this and, and maybe the film I was thinking about was Underworld, which is another similar mm. type of gothic type vampire werewolf film, which I'm sure we'll get round to reviewing on the show at some point in the future. But I thoroughly enjoyed it last night. So whether my memory is cheating and whether I did watch it all those years ago and for some reason I've just forgotten about it or not, it is one of the best action films, one of the best horror films, one of the best vampire films there is. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you about it today. Thank you, everybody, once again for tuning in to Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. Whether you listen to this, whether you watch this, we really do appreciate you taking the time to soaking up our passion for marketing and our passion for films. And please do, if you've got any comments that you want to make, if you've got any questions you want to ask us, just pop a comment in to the YouTube channel or hit us up on, the, uh, on, on Twitter or whatever it might be. And that is it for this week, Pascal, I think. Thank you for watching, everybody. Please make sure that you go out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. See you later. My name is Roger Edwards, and he was Pascal Fintoni. Yeah.